How does that sound as a way of working? Bloody amazing, Bob. <laughs> as a way of working. All that from between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was such a good metaphor. Whatever motor, motor, metaphor they bring in. Yeah. It, it, you know, because they're symbolically talking about the internal world. And also, you can use the, that and help them validate that and express the meaning and look at how, you know, what that means in terms of how it was and where they want to go in the future. Yeah and where they are in the present, so they can get to their future contract. I, lo I love the way it's connected into the, you know, the therapeutic, you know, aspects really? of the treatment goals and all those sorts of things. I love that. Yeah. One of the metaphors I used to use an awful lot when I was doing my psychotherapy training was that my head's a shed. <laughs> Your head's a shed. Yeah, full of rubbish, literally. Yeah. You know when you have a shed and you put all the yeah. crap in it? Yeah, yeah. but see, that yeah. means something. So, so a therapist working with metaphors, using this type of model, first of all, they'd use this, they'd validate the metaphor, have a curiosity about where the metaphor came from, and help you reflect and understand how that fits into not only understanding your internal world from the world you came from but how you can actually move to a different place yeah we demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations this is the therapy show behind closed doors podcast with bob cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 87 of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with a wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about working with metaphors in the therapy room. Yes. You know, Storytelling, Bob. <laughs> Is it like so Jack and Ori? A bit like that. It's so like freezing outside. Uh, I, was, I was just thinking about a metaphor um, I could sort of symbol to describe how I symbolically feel at the moment so uh yes yes let's talk about metaphors so metaphors are so important in the world of psychotherapy because uh, uh, really they're used to help the client express what's happening internally from a symbolic place yeah so you know we could think I'm sure you and I could think of lots and lots of metaphors I, I personally don't think there's many sessions that I don't use metaphors I was I was thinking about well and our clients use them all the time for example so and they they they, they use it really to express um, um their emotions or their thoughts at a symbolic level it's no, it's another way of um getting to their internal way internal world in quite a creative way through symbolism yeah, I find it helps and it works if you've got a very um, logical client, <laughs> you know, to get them to imagine a feeling as a colour or, or, you know, it, it, it describe it in words or whatever it is. And it kind of gets them out of the head and more into the feeling rather than being very logical about things. Oh. So it reminds me of, um, whoa, we're going back to 1988 or something. I just moved to, the, I just founded the Institute. It was called the Livestream Centre then. And the I- The Institute, your Institute was called yes. the Livestream Centre. So, yeah, from wow. 1988 to 1993, it was called the Livestream Centre. And it got that name because before I became a therapist, I was a teacher in a technical college and I taught various, uh, I taught politics and different things, but I also taught liberal studies to these 17 and 18 year old students who, on a Friday afternoon. And on one Friday afternoon, I said to them, look, I'm going to, as you know, I'll be leaving soon because I'm going to start a new career and I'm going to start a psychotherapy centre. What shall I call it? And um, they gave loads of noise. And one of the names somebody said to was, live stream because it represents the stream of life wow 
<laughs> and I liked it so much. I called my new centre the live stream centre. That was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like that for a long time until um, until 1993. I finished my training and um, I got my uh, exams to be a tra international trainer. And I decided to have a more formal name yeah. for the institute. And I, could, and I wanted to call it the Manchester Institute for Integrative Psychotherapy because at that time I met Richard Erskine, who was the president of the integrative, well, he hadn't formed it then, but the integrative work, integrative uh, organisation, which he formed later in 99, I think. But anyway, he had started writing about integrative psychotherapy, so I was starting to see integration as a major form of cure. So I wanted to call it the Manchester Institute for Integrative Integrative psychotherapy. But my secretary at the time couldn't say the word integrative. She, so, she was so northern. She was called, hello, it's the Manchester Institute for Integrative Psychotherapy. And goodness <laughs> knows what. Uh, and after six months, I decided to drop the integrative. To be fair, it is a bit of a mouthful, Bob. When you're <laughs> answering the phone, it is a bit of a long one. Yeah. I called the Manchester Institute for Psychotherapy. Um, but I, but uh, it was called the Livestream Centre. And it was a sort of a metaphor for the stream of life. Yeah. So my institute was formed from a metaphor. I love that story. Yeah, so my centre was called the Lifestream because it's a metaphor for the uh, stream of life. And also, if you want to put it another way, the stream of uh, narratives that goes through our whole consciousness. Yeah. And sometimes I think, oh, I wish I never dropped it because I liked it so much. I, I created a more formal name, uh, but I, I really did like the live stream centre. But in those days, going back to what I say about motorbikes, uh, I ran seminar, seminars for 20 odd years, but um, they were six o'clock or 6.30 till 9.30 on a Friday night. And we got some um, psychodramatists in and I arrived sort of 20 minutes till the seminar was to start. And they and these two had just arrived, and they said uh, who run, who was running the actual psychodramatist seminar, and they said, oh, we have to have all the pictures off the walls, and we had a lot of them on this big wall. I said, what for? Uh, and she she said, oh well, that's to stop any um, any projections that the uh, audience participants might have onto the pictures. We had a completely uh, blank wall and you see I've always sort of remembered this uh, even though I've done the opposite in my therapy rooms which is have lots of things for people to project things onto because I think we can work with symbolism what the picture represents the metaphors how they see or the, the scenery of what's in the pictures to get back to the internal world of the client yeah it's all grist to the mill to me so I come from a different place altogether. Yeah. Where you started, which is like, I might say to a client, you know, um, just imagine that you, uh, whatever, you know, you were a fly on the wall looking down at your uh, dysfunctional family. How would you describe that? Or what would your feelings be? Or what do you see is happening? You know, so I think it's really important metaphors. I things go in better with me with metaphors if somebody's trying to describe something and they can put it into a metaphor that I can relate to then it kind of goes in a lot a lot deeper not only better but deeper yeah so couples therapy particularly yeah so you know people come for couples therapy and I've done a lot of it in the past and you'll say okay so how, give me a metaphor of how you see your marriage at the moment yeah and they might say you know, it's just like a cold, freezing tank in the middle of Siberia and no one can get in or out and I'm trapped in it or whatever it is to, yeah. you know, to describe there and to use that. It's all about symbolism. Yeah, because in the English language, we do, as you're talking, I'm thinking of that saying between a rock and a hard place. Yes. You know, we use metaphors quite well, normally in, in the English language. Yeah. Yeah. And and very rarely does a session go past where the client won't use a metaphor. Yeah. 
and then you know and of course there's metaphor therapy i i thought oh i'll just look into wikipedia just before i start this podcast and look at what they say about metaphors so i'll just for a moment read it out so yeah. I, I put that in and it said um metaphor therapy was called in the psychotherapy practice and this is for a, a, a way of thinking about how to use metaphors so metaphor and psychotherapy due to practice can be accomplished using a six-stage model Ooh. to work with patient generated metaphors number one hearing and suspending making sense of the metaphor in other words somebody says like between a rock and a hard place oh that's interesting what does that really mean to you then uh -huh. yeah so you get so the therapist is exploring the meanings of that metaphor from an internal frame of reference number two validating and expressing interest in that metaphor in other words oh the therapist is really curious wow that's a really interesting way you've described how you felt when you were 17 or 18 you felt that you were between a rock and a hard place gosh tell me a little bit more about how that felt so that's accounting and validating and being curious about how they symbolically see their world at the age of 16 or 17 yeah number three expanding the metaphor by encouraging descriptions of associations emotions and imagery i mean the therapist might share their own associations there so that would be oh you know as you talk to me about how you felt in that house and those dilemmas that were happening when you were 16 or 17 and how you symbolically felt between a you know a, hard rock or place or however you described it you know i'm just thinking about how you talked about your life in earlier sessions where you talked about feeling as a bystander and caught up in a real whirlwind of emotions and you must have felt pretty in a turmoil so you go on or you might or you might say to the person wow so that's really in between a rock and a hard place so if you were to imagine that even more and expand those internal ways of you thinking about yourself how about just and you expand the metaphor yeah so you can ask the person to even reflect more on their internal world so they might say well actually you know when i think about it i was so dissociated so fragmented i felt so far removed and they would start then talking perhaps about their fragmented world yeah Number four, playing with the possibilities by exploring what the metaphor might mean. So I you like might, <laughs> so you might then go on to explain. Oh, that's an interesting between a rock and a hard place. So tell me again what that meant for you. Oh, that meant you felt divided and fragmented. And so, what other metaphor might you have? I mean, I was thinking of Edward Scissorhands, for example, when you're talking about being fragmented you know that's yeah scissors hands was a film in the 1970s yeah, yeah. next then, number five marking and selecting the aspects that support the current treatment goals so for example oh how did you tell me about feeling so fragmented and split off and between a rock and a hard place i was just thinking about where we're heading in therapy today which is to be more integrated and more present and more in the here and now and there seems such a gap between that symbolism of your younger self and today what do you think needs to happen in therapy so we can move to a different place it's, it's it, as you're talking through all of these steps bob it's, it sounds really powerful <laughs> yeah i think it's great Number six, connecting with the future by outlining tasks that lie ahead based on sharing understandings derived from the metaphor. So the last step, connecting with the future by outlining tasks that lie ahead 
based on sharing understandings derived from the original metaphor. So I'll go on again. So, you know, that's, you know, as you talk about how you felt between a rock and a hard place and a fragmented part of yourself. And we know when you came into therapy, you just wanted to have more of a connection with the world and more of a connection with relationships and you struggle in maintaining relationships. And as we look at what needs to be done from that 17 year old boy that felt that way and this 26 year old person in this new world and the steps we outline, let's just go through what those steps are again so we can heal that younger self to get to where we are today and the future. How does that sound as a way of working? Bloody amazing, Bob. <laughs> as a way of working. All that from between a rock and hard place. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was such a good metaphor. Whatever motor, motor, metaphor they bring in. Yeah. It, it, you know, because they're symbolically talking about the internal world. And also, you can use the, that and help them validate that and express the meaning and look at how, you know, what that means in terms of how it was and where they want to go in the future. Yeah and where they are in the present so they can get to their future contract. I love, I love the way it's connected into the, you know, the therapeutic, you know, aspects really? of the treatment goals and the, all those sorts of things. I love that. Yeah. One of the metaphors I used to use an awful lot when I was doing my psychotherapy training was that my head's a shed. <laughs> Your head's a shed. Yeah, full of rubbish, literally. Yeah. You know when you have a shed and you put all the yeah. crap in it? Yeah, yeah. but see, yeah. that means something. So, so a therapist working with metaphors using this type of model, first of all, they'd use this, they'd validate the metaphor, have a curiosity about where the metaphor came from, and help you reflect and understand how that fits into not only understanding your internal world from the world you came from but how you can actually move to a different place yeah and visualization and things like that one i think when we visualize something we connect more emotionally with it rather than just using words and language and and you know things well, like that yeah it's, yeah it's a you lot are more powerful yeah yeah you absolutely had to hit on a really good thing and that is what you hit on early on was the therapist, sorry, the client that comes in who's highly cognitive, uses intellectualization as a defense process. Yeah. Those types of people, symbolism, they often find very hard, by the way. Yeah. Um, metaphor, also quite challenging. However, in my experience, they have a desire to be able to uh, talk about their life symbolically. The issue is giving them permission to just try the process out. So yeah. for example, you could say to somebody, oh, you know, I've been thinking and I often feel, you know, in the therapy we get caught up in a cognitive process and I'd just like to try something for a moment. You know, when you're talking about how it was for you at boarding school, Let's just try you talking symbolically how it was for you. Or use any metaphor you like, and I'll explain a metaphor, you know, and what a metaphor means, but just for a moment, let's move away from cognition to having a go at talking about how it was for you symbolically. Yeah. That is a wonderful way to help person from a very um how can i explain this so they don't feel shamed in any way yeah Their cognition is i don't know um somehow a, a shameful process or, or, or whatever they can attempt to use sy symbolism or metaphor as a way of in describing uh their internal world and a bridge to emotion yeah 
I love that. Is it something to do with it kind of depersonalizes it when you're talking about a metaphor? It's kind of like it, it's not about me. It's about, you know, the, the rock and the hard place or yeah, the shed yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's it's, they're kind yeah. of detached from it in a way. Yeah, yeah it, it's a, it can often be used as a way of what you've just said, maybe depersonalizing, uh, uh, moving away from shame. Yeah. Uh, but if you think of metaphors as symbolism, um, I, I, somebody asked to me, what would I have done if I hadn't been a psychotherapist for 37, 38 years? Um, and I answered, I'd love to have been an anthropologist. Wow. Or even a social anthropologist. But, um, and I love traveling. Yeah, and, we know uh, that, Bob. You have a lot of holidays. <laughs> he also said, if I wasn't a social anthropologist, I'd like to be a historian because I think in stories. Yeah. We know that if you go back and back and back and back in time, mm. cavemen used to draw in metaphors on their, you know, their cave. Yeah. yeah. We know that if you open up the Bible, it's nearly all, you know, the Bible is full of, you know, fables, parallels, symbolisms, and metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible is a way of teaching. You know, most, I haven't read the Bible for a while, but if you go to the Gospels, it's full of metaphors. Yeah. Because that's the way that Jesus taught. Yeah. And it is powerful if you're using metaphors. People emotionally connect with it. You can visualize it. It's kind of like brings in your senses rather than just hearing the words. Yeah. Because the word, mind you, I suppose metaphors are open to our own adaption of it or whatever. But, you know. Analogies or. Metaphors. That's it. If somebody says a load of words, we read into that what we want. Whereas, you know, if you can visualize it and mm. there's a story around it, you can kind of follow it a lot better. Yeah. You go to major, major religions. Let's pick Buddhism. Yeah. It's full of analogies and metaphors all the time. If you look at what the great gurus said. They don't speak transactionally, logically. Yeah. They talk in symbolism, metaphors. Why? Because it goes to a different creative part of our neurological system. Yeah. I love that. It bypasses all the baggage sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to do therapy. Yeah. You started off the pop podcast by saying, is it linked to narrative therapy? The answer is yes. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because narrative therapy is, is, at its essence, storytelling. And storytelling goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years and is the basis of early healing. Yeah. And if you go to the basis of narrative and storytelling, then nearly always is the use of metaphor and analogies in the stories. I, I think it, it would be a wonderful session to get out of the logic side of things and just have a discussion about metaphors and putting our thoughts and feelings into a story or a, a visualization or something. Uh, I, I, Quite I, free, I would, really. I'd really recommend anybody listening to this. And I expect that everybody listening to this, if the therapists have used metaphors, I bet anybody who listened to this have been clients have used metaphors. And I bet you anybody who hasn't been therapist or clients listen to podcasts have used metaphors in their life anyway. I agree, Bob. But as you were saying that, I, I completely agree with it, but I don't think I've utilised it enough in the therapy room. Oh, yes. <laughs> we yeah. might use the words, but I don't think I've used it, you know, therapeutically in the therapy room. Probably, and, and I was just thinking myself in the training of therapists, we haven't got a weekend on how to use metaphors and analogies and, in accessing the younger self. And I think we should have, um, uh, because it's such a wonderful, wonderful way of uh, helping people look at their, not only their younger self, but their internal, wor internal world through past, present and future. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should put that on the agenda for the institute as well. I think yeah. I'll I'll come yeah. and sit in on that one, Bob. Yeah, no doubt. And and again, if you put in any therapist clients, one of who's interested in this, to just put metaphors in therapy into Google and you or Amazon, you come up with lots of books. Yeah. Talks a lot about how to use 
metaphors, how to use analogies, and how to use symbolism in psychotherapy. And they're fantastic. Another point I want to say, because we did the podcast last time on how to how to get to the how to get to the younger self, I think, in psychotherapy. Think about this in terms of developmental tasks and learning to talk. Yeah. And how, how very the younger we go, the more we, you know, actually start thinking, I think, in symbolism and metaphors before actually construction of language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a huge way of getting to the younger part of the, the self. Yeah. And, you know, as you were speaking, then I was thinking about, you know, the younger self and story time and, you know, what that's like sitting with a young child reading through a story and, you know, the, the imagination that they use and the connection and, and everything else around storytelling. It's like you say, our ancestors, that's how they they didn't write things down. It was all, you know, word of mouth and passed down through storytelling, story. folklore, story. whatever. Yeah, I say, look at any religion, uh, Christian religion, which is a dominant religion in the world, I think, though some might argue, but I, I was hearing, you know, recently that, you know, uh, you know, we've gone down in the United Kingdom to about 46% of people's Christ, major Christian religion, but any, any, any religion, they all use, they all use metaphors, yeah, all use symbols, all use stories that have been passed down. I'm going to look or I'm going to Google the most used metaphors and see what they are. I think you the one you used about rock and a hard place. I bet that's pretty top. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it'll be an interesting list, that, and see yeah. what I visualise and what yeah. comes up for me with each one of them. Oh, that'd be fantastic little uh, task. Yeah. But I, I do think that if therapists can utilise symbolism, metaphors as a way to not only look at um you know the turmoil of the past or how people uh, internally feel now but how they may want to get to the future i mean ta there's a huge emphasis on contractual theory now i think you could utilize contractual theory through the use of method metaphors and symbolism in terms of how you're not only feeling today, but where you want to go in the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine that clients, you know, the certain clients would find it very easy to do that, mm. to mm. have a visual representation of where they want to be or, or how they want to feel or whatever. Yeah. And then draw it. Yeah. So in my therapy intensives, I start off, and I still do some of them, by the way, I use it two or three a year. Um, I don't contract the normal way. Well, the way I do contracting is that they draw, and I could do it through, meta I could do it through metaphor, now I'm thinking about it. So they draw with their left hand, usually their non-dominant hand, uh, once, what they want from the therapy process. Um, they then draw or write down if they want to, how they stop themselves getting what they want, and then how they can utilize the change in the future. But you can do all, though I do it all that way, but you could do it easily by metaphor. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I would imagine that task that you set them is quite challenging for adults in a room to, to use the non dominant hand and to draw yeah. pictures. It's, it's quite an ask, that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, it takes them back to their younger. I was going to say, quicker, yeah, quicker than just cognitively sitting down and having constructed writing. Yeah, definitely. All the feelings would come up about being, yeah. you know, writing for the first time. That's it. Yeah, I'm not confident at this. I don't know how to do it. All the doubts and everything. <laughs> yeah, you can see I've been a therapist a long time and working with the younger self, haven't you? Yeah. But uh, I do like metaphors. Me too now. I think I'm, I'm going to utilise that a lot more in the room. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think that if you can link it in with what people want in the future as well. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah. I know I say this at the end of every podcast, Bob, but I really enjoyed this one. <laughs> 
No, I, I, I enjoyed this one. And I'll tell you why I've enjoyed it, because I have a great passion for narrative therapy. I have a great passion for metaphors. I have a great passion for one, working with the younger self. Yeah. And I have a great passion in helping people understand themselves. And often one of the biggest tools to help people understand themselves isn't through cognition. Oh. It's through a different part of their neurological system, which has its basis usually in creativity and symbolism. Yeah, definitely. Because it kind of gets underneath the conscious level of thinking when we're, we're, we're doing that sort of stuff. Things sneak in that we probably wouldn't think about, but they come out, yeah. And that to me is good therapy when it's not hard work, when it just flows. I love the way it sneaks in. It does. The, the, the good stuff <laughs> always just sneaks in, Bob. <laughs> it, cre it creeps in under the carpet or some. No, it's some under the radar. It. That's it what it does. just happens. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is where the... me, that's that's real transformation when it sneaks in. Yeah. Yeah. Now, often people say to me, or clients, "Is therapy can be like magic?" Mm -hmm. Now, symbolism, magic, metaphors—they're all in the same ballpark. Yeah. Transformation. Yeah. All the same ballpark. It's all voodoo stuff, Bob. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I think therapy is so much in the land of the unconscious and if we can have tools like metaphor symbolism that type of process that i've just talking about which can get to those levels that we repress uh in the service of living and coping uh then we're on to a winner yeah I'm so pleased that i met you in my life bob and that i trained at the institute and that we do this now Likewise, uh, we've been doing it for. Oh God, I don't. This is I don't even know what number of budget this is, but we've been doing it for a long time. Eighty-seven weeks we've been doing this, but there's, yeah. there's never a podcast that we do that I don't take away some gems. Whenever, whenever I meet with you or speak with you, there's something that I always take away from it. So I want to thank you for that, Bob. You're welcome, and I also say the say the same back to you. I've uh you, you've given me the chance to talk about what i found most pleasurable uh in my career yeah and what a long career it's been and still is and still is i was you've not just hung up your you court yet there's another metaphor <laughs> what did you say i said you've not hung up your court yet so there's another no, metaphor. no no i'm not that long in the tooth that's another metaphor exactly i've decided actually I'm going to go on a bit more than only the other day. I was thinking of retiring, but actually uh, I'm going to carry on a little bit more. And, um, you know, I just think long in the tooth, there's another metaphor for you. But I I, I, I do love this, the, the chance of these podcasts to talk about, you know, uh, the wonder of psychotherapy. Yeah. And it is. It's a joy to be a part of. So thank you for that. And what's the next one? The next one, because we're speeding towards Valentine's Day um, next week, I thought we could do something about relationship breakdowns. Yeah, I mean, Valentine's was Day was never a happy day for me. Did you not get any cards, Bob? I'll send you one. Well, it wasn't just about that. It was about rejection and about despair and about envy and about jealousy, feeling inadequate. So, you know... Uh, and certainly relationship breakdowns, but of course, I won't go into my woe of my history. <laughs> a, lot of my, a lot of my clients, February, the, you know, Valentine's Day was not a particularly good day. So I, th I think we'll do something around relationships in one form or another. For yeah, about breakdown. Yeah. I, yeah, I I think that. Yeah. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Until next time, Bob. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.